Well, we're on to module 10. I'm going to start module 10 with a little straight math, to be perfectly honest, uh, but it's useful math, so bear with me. So let's talk about Euler's theorem as it relates to thermodynamics. Now, it turns out Euler was a pretty prolific uh, mathematician, and there's a few different things that bear his name and the word theorem. I'm going to talk about a particular one, and what I want to talk about is what Euler uh, determined for homogeneous functions. And so let's define a homogeneous function. A homogeneous function of degree m exhibits the following behavior when you scale its arguments. So if you have some function of a variety of variables, so these x1 through x sub n variables, and I scale them all, so I just multiply by, by some constant, lambda. A function is homogeneous if it turns out to be the case that that value, the, the function takes on values which are equal to lambda to the mth power times the values of the function with the unscaled variables. And so m can be any power, 0, 1, 2, 3, what have you. But that defines a homogeneous function of degree m. And Euler's theorem says that for such homogeneous functions, m times the function is equal to the sum over all the number of variables, value of the variable times the partial derivative of f with respect to the variable. And if that doesn't look particularly useful yet, there's no obvious reason it should, but it is a kind of interesting mathematical theorem. In order to prove that theorem, we may as well prove it, it's not that hard, uh, let's differentiate both sides of this top equation, which defines homogeneous equations, by lambda. So partial partial lambda of both sides, that's not too hard. I got partial partial lambda of products of functions here basically, or nested functions. So I'll get partial f with respect to its variable. Its variable is lambda x sub 1 in this case, and then 2 and so on, so I have a sum. And by the chain rule, then I need to differentiate the variable by lambda. Meanwhile, this side is quite easy. I, here's the only place lambda appears m lambda to the m minus 1. Uh, this is a very easy derivative to do. It just takes the lambda out. Here's this x sub i. So I've got partial f with respect to partial lambda x sub i. And since homogeneity holds for all values of lambda, I can select one. I'll select 1. So when I do that, the lambda here is, is 1. It goes away, so I have that equation. And 1 to whatever power is 1, and so sure enough, I achieve Euler's theorem, so not all that hard to prove. Quod erat demonstratum. How is that relevant to thermodynamics, you wonder? Well, let's think about the particular case, not of all possible homogeneous functions, but homogeneous functions of degree 1. Okay, so in that case, I have f of scaling some variables is equal to whatever the scaling factor is times f. If I were to express that more in words, what I might say is double the size of my system. That would be using lambda 2, right? All my variables go up by a factor of 2. Uh, triple, factor of 3, quadruple, whatever. So, and then evaluate on with that function. And I will get back whatever the value was for the smaller system times that scale factor. So double the size of the system, get double the energy of the original system. Uh, or whatever I was measuring. F might have been energy, it might have been something else. Double the value of the function. But that's, that's what an extensive thermodynamic variable is. Double the uh, size of the system, yes indeed, get double the energy. Double the uh, volume of the system, get double the volume. I guess that one's sort of straightforward. But enthalpy, you, you pick an extensive variable and that's how it behaves. So thermodynamic functions are homogeneous functions of degree one. So uh, let's exploit that a bit and take Euler's theorem plugging in m equals one and it says that the value of the function is equal to 
the variables of the function times the partial derivative of the function with respect to those variables. Let me take a particular example. Let's take the Gibbs free energy and we'll do constant temperature and constant pressure. Temperature and pressure are not extensive variables, right? They're intensive variables. I'm going to hold them fixed. So that means the free energy will now only depend on, say, number of particles, for instance. And I'll use a two-component system. So I'll have two different kinds of particles, some of component one, some of component two. So Euler's theorem allows me to say that the free energy of these, of the system containing these two components is equal to the number, let's call these moles for now, number of moles of component one times the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to that number of moles plus number of moles of component two times the partial derivative of free energy with respect to component two. And that's just e expanding the right hand side of the, of the uh, equation. So why is that so useful? Well, if one were forced to ask the question, answer the question of, you know, what's the free energy for this mixture? That might be a hard question to answer. This looks a little bit more tractable because it seems to say, listen, I really can only focus on one substance at a time and sum together some quantities to understand the quantities of a mixture. Moreover, we actually already have a definition for these derivatives. Those are the chemical potentials. So if I were to write this in a really formal mathematical way to try to emphasize what's being held constant and the like, I would write that the free energy, which is a function of the number of moles of component one and component two, and takes as parameters fixed values of pressure and temperature, so P and T fixed, it will be equal to number of moles of one times, and I'll not, now I'll just write this with the shorthand we use, the chemical potential for one, which depends on pressure and temperature, and N2 times the chemical potential of two. So that notation is there to really emphasize that we want to, uh, we're holding P and T fixed. If we use a different P and T, the chemical potentials will be different, the total free energy will be different. <coughs> Often we will not emphasize that again and again, we'll just write it in a somewhat shorter form that G is equal to N1 mu1 plus N2 mu2. So let me do that slightly differently. I'll do an alternative derivation of that last equation. So what I could do is just take the total differential of the free energy with respect to all its variables. And in this case, for the first time, I'm including two different substances. In the last module, we just worked with a single substance. Now I want to work with binary mixtures. So I'll differentiate with respect to the first substance, with respect to the second substance, with respect to pressure, with respect to temperature, in every case holding all the other variables constant. If pressure and temperature are constant, these last two terms drop out. So I will get dg equals mu dn1 plus mu2 dn2. And now if I play around a bit with boundary conditions, and so the textbook actually does it this way. It says, well, think about the, there being none of anything. In that case, we know that g would be zero. And now imagine that you've got one mole of each and you integrate up to one mole and you really do the integrals. You would end up with the same expression and want that the full G is sum of chemical potential for one times number of moles of one plus chemical potential two times number of moles of two. But Euler's theorem is, is completely general, right? It avoids us having to do that kind of boundary value analysis for every single extensive variable we may be interested in. And it just immediately allows us to write down number of moles of things times partial derivatives of things. And that can often be considerably more convenient. And so we'll probably exploit that more in the future. And the future, of course, will begin in the next video. And in that video, we'll look at partial molar quantities in general, and we'll look at something called the Gibbs-Duham equation.